this is what you see. A land as flat as a pancake, with fields of ripened wheat stretching into the horizon. This is just about the center of the geographical area called the Great Plains, which lies mainly across parts of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and extends north to the Arctic Ocean in Canada, and far south into the United States. This film is about the Canadian part of the Great Plains and its people. The line on the map shows the route taken by the first white settlers to come here about 150 years ago. They were 80 Scottish families looking for new land to farm. They turned hopefully to the Great Plains, seen here looking to the west. Down through Lake Winnipeg they went, south into the Red River, Nobody had ever farmed here before. It was an idea of what happened. The settlers saw here and there on the broad land the teepees of Indians, the native people of the plains. These Indians were nomads who roamed across the land hunting wild animals for food and clothing. They had already met white men a few adventurers had come even before the settlers to buy beaver pelts from the Indians and send them back to Europe to sell at a profit. These fur traders built trading posts like Lower Fort Garry on the Red River. The men from Scotland and their descendants looked at the fertile land around and knew that they had come to the right place. Farming wasn't easy. The seed they had brought was not right for the soil. Winters were bitterly cold. But they stuck to it. In time, crops of grain sprang up, and there were good harvests. More settlers came. And today, stretching back from the banks of the Red River out into the prairie, there are hundreds of farms. Let's go down and look at one of these farms. This one is owned by the great-great-grandson of one of those first settlers who came from Scotland. His name is Douglas Scott. The black soil he tills is still... On it, Mr. Scott usually plants wheat, oats, and barley. Mrs. Scott has a garden. Their daughters help milk the cows they keep and feed the pigs and chickens. In the middle of this mixed farming area, a city has grown. Winnipeg, the capital of Manitoba, and the oldest and largest city of the Great Plains. It stands on the Red River, where once there was a fur trading fort. Portage Avenue used to be only a settler's wagon trail to the west. Now, over 350,000 people live in Greater Winnipeg. They earn their bread and butter doing all kinds of things. They keep stores, work in clothing factories, and carry on a modern version of the old fur trade. A great many are busy processing what comes in from the country. They slaughter cattle, pack meat in huge packing plants, they tan cattle hides. They work in mills where grain is ground into feed and flour. Some of the flour manufactured here is baked into bread in Winnipeg, but most of it is shipped out to other markets, the United Kingdom, Trinidad, Cuba, for example. Railway traffic is the main reason for Winnipeg's size and importance, and many, many people work in the huge rail yards. The flow of traffic is heavy, for Winnipeg is the connecting point that links eastern Canada and the west. The first single line was pushed through to the distant Pacific in 1885. 
Now a vast railway network reaches westward from Winnipeg into the prairies like the branches of a tree. This was the next part of the Great Plains to be settled, and settlement followed the railway. A journey that before the railway had taken three weeks by creaking ox cart became a matter of hours with an iron horse rolling on rails of steel. Settlers reached easily a country they found ideal for growing wheat. And soon, freight trains roared back east to Winnipeg, laden with grain and cattle, as they do today. Every few miles along the railway, little towns sprang up, and with them, tall grain elevators, in which grain is stored before it's shipped away. Almost everywhere you look now in the prairies, these elevators rise above fields of wheat, awaiting the harvest. John Richards is a wheat farmer in southern Saskatchewan. In August, you'll find him, like thousands of others, busy with a combine and pickup truck, hurrying to get in the harvest. His farm is one square mile, and it takes him a little over a week. Old Mr. Richards came at the turn of the century from a small farm in Ontario to spend his life in this grain country. Prairie wheat is a hard wheat, ripened in the long, hot, windy days and cool nights typical of the southern plains. In its top grades, it's rated the best there is, and this has become one of the foremost grain-growing areas in the world. In the center of this wheat growing country is the city of Regina, the capital of Saskatchewan. Regina is mainly a distributing center for its surrounding area. Implement companies, for example, have their warehouses here. The people of Regina also assemble cars, slaughter and pack meat, mill grain, work in the construction industry, and at the other jobs of a growing city. West of Regina, the Great Plains continue another 500 miles, right to the Rocky Mountains. But if you go west as the settlers went in the past, the land begins to look different. It becomes rolling and drier. It's a kind of country good for ranching, for on it only short, hardy grasses grow. This ranch on the Red Deer River in Alberta is operated by Mr. Carl Olufsen, who came here from the United States. This part of the plains has always had the feel of adventure. Early in its history, a painter named Miller painted some pictures of an exciting spectacle that he often saw here, an Indian buffalo hunt. On modern-day ranches, which often are thousands of acres in size, life is more peaceful than in the old days. The buffalo have long since disappeared from the open ranches. Now beef cattle, and in some places sheep, graze on the same grass, and are herded from one range to another, or to a water hole to drink.
Many of the Indians whose grandfathers used to ride bareback, whooping after buffalo, are proud and skillful cowboys. Ranchers ship their stock to cattle yards, like this one in Calgary, for sorting out and selling. It was as a cattle shipping center that Calgary started. Now it has grown also into a modern processing, manufacturing, and financial center. With the city of Calgary and the surrounding countryside lying within sight of the Rockies, we've come to the western limits of the Great Plains. We've seen something of their fertility, their vastness, and their beauty. But in some ways, the plains are a hard land, mostly because of their climate. Prairie winters are often bitterly cold, sometimes so cold that telephone wires rattle with the frost. If a farmer's crop isn't harvested early enough, it is frozen and useless. Stock, often watered at water holes chopped in the ice, has to be kept in barns. On ranches where they have little shelter, sometimes whole herds of cattle have been endangered by blizzards. The hot summers of the southern prairies have created difficulties too. These parts of the plains have very little rain, and the hot sun and almost continuous dry winds sometimes parch the land. In these dry places, the soil, loosened by plowing, often blows. On occasion, dust storms have howled here. freely blowing over open ground hurled soil over a blistering, choking landscape. As these old films show, the worst of these droughts in the early 1930s ruined a part of the prairie. Nobody could believe that only three years before their farms had been green and rich. Heat, wind, and not a drop of rain had turned a vast area into virtually a desert. Now little grew except tumbleweed and Russian thistle. Many farmers, in despair, moved away. They left behind them what was called the Dust Bowl, an irregular triangle of wasted land in southern Saskatchewan and Alberta. Many went north to the partly settled Grove Belt. The Grove Belt is a strip of mixed farming land running between the open southern prairies and the northern forests of the plains, from the mountains in the west to beyond Winnipeg. It is rolling country, dotted with groves of trees. Here, because there is more moisture, farming is less hazardous after the hard work of clearing the land has been done. Even today, the northern fringes of the Grove Belt are being pushed back by the machines and muscles of more recent settlers. Kazmir Warshawski came from Europe, as have many of the people in the northern part of the plains, to clear himself a farm in this area, where though the winters are severe, the land is rich and the rainfall dependable. However, the difficulties of dryness, early winters and other problems like rust have been tackled head on. Scientists at experimental farms are developing varieties of grain that will resist dryness and rust and mature quickly. 
In dry areas, the farmers themselves have learned to cultivate their farms in new ways. They leave their land fallow only in strips between planted parts, so the wind cannot blow the soil away. The ruined country has turned golden again. In some places even, like St. Mary's River in southern Alberta, dams have been built to store water. This water is used to irrigate half a million acres of land in this warmest part of the prairies. Given lots of water, special crops grow on the hot, dry soil here. Corn, cabbages, sugar beets, beans, melons. These Japanese Canadians are laborers who make their living by helping to harvest the bounty of irrigation. The land of the plains has changed tremendously in the space of a man's lifetime. Not so long ago, it was mainly grassland and bush. Now, with man's toil, it supports two and a half million people for whom its rolling fields are home. But the plains have offered more than agriculture. Not many years ago, in the Turner Valley in Alberta, you might have been wakened one morning by a strange sound and seen on the horizon a giant machine. Men were probing with a steel tube a mile long, deep into the earth, drilling for oil. Down under the layers of rock we live on, in some places there are deposits of black, sticky petroleum. It is generally believed that this oil was formed many millions of years ago out of the dead bodies of sea creatures crushed at the bottom of a great sea that then covered much of the plains. These prehistoric flora and fauna were also the source of natural gas, which is found with oil. In a similar way, the trees of that distant age fell and were turned into coal. That old sea receded long ago. Now, where oil crews have drilled in the right places, pumps suck the precious oil up from its ancient underground bed. To carry the oil to where it will be refined, pipelines are built. These are large tubes buried in ditches in the ground. When they're finished, crude oil is pumped through them hundreds of miles across the plains to refineries on the outskirts of cities. A refinery is a maze of chemical machinery where crude oil is turned into products essential to a modern country's life. From oil, we obtain, among other things, the fuels that power ships, trains, tractors, cars, combines, most of the many machines we have come to depend on. Agriculture was the first, and oil was the second major gift of the plains. Prairie oil was first found in Alberta. It has been discovered in many places since then, as far east as Manitoba, but the main fields are around the city of Edmonton. Edmonton is now one of the most important cities of the prairies. In 15 years, its population has grown by half. It has the feel of a boom city. Business has prospered, new buildings are rising into the sky, stores, factories, offices, everywhere you look, people are busy. 
This activity has been partly because of the surrounding oil wells, but also because Edmonton is a new kind of transportation center, the aerial gateway to a still undeveloped part of the plains. At its busy airport, planes are loaded day and night with freight of all descriptions, groceries, canoes, even bulldozers, by adventurous men looking in a new direction. When the planes take off, they leave behind them the farmlands of the prairies and turn to head into the last unexploited part of the Great Plains, the North. This country, forested, covered with rivers and lakes, seems empty. But it has already yielded lumber, furs, some minerals, and it has more wealth. In the Athabasca tar sands near Fort McMurray, there is more oil on the surface of the ground than is known of in all the rest of the world put together. It is mixed up with sand, but scientists know how it can be freed when it's needed. The North, stretching to the Arctic Ocean, is waiting to be put to man's use to add its riches to the bounty of the already settled areas of the Great Plains.